Thank you so much for being here. want to welcome you to our service today, and we want to say Merry Christmas. For those of you that are joining us online as well, we're so glad that you're a part of Stillwater's Church, and thank you for participating with us this morning. Well, today I'm going to begin a brand new series that's going to go for the next four weeks, and the title of the series is called This Christmas, and we're going to be looking at some things that I believe will be a fresh way to look at Christmas. To be honest, I struggle sometimes with preaching about Christmas, not that there's, it's difficult to preach about Christmas, but uh, it's really the same story, and you look for fresh ways to kind of give the same message. But it dawned on me recently that that's not really necessary. You tell the story the way God has given it to us, and that in and of itself is something that inspires hope in us. That's what makes Christmas Christmas. And let's be honest, a lot of people face stress at Christmas. There are some people, even people in our church, that have lost a loved one. And at Christmas time, particularly, they struggle. They are a little discouraged, maybe a, a little depressed. And some of you, because you've moved or because you're not close to your parents uh, like you were when you were a child, or you can't see your grandmother because she's passed. And so for a lot of people, Christmas represents stress. But today, and for the next four weeks, we want to reintroduce you to the story of Christ's birth. And I really do believe this, that the story of the birth of Jesus is a story of hope. Now, now, if you get stressed out during the holidays because this year you are hosting the family and you're doing all this cooking and your you know, pressure cooker is about to blow its lid because you're so stressed out, or maybe uh, you're thinking that you've got a top last year and you do that every year and you try to get a better and a better and a better gift and you go more and more into debt, I just want to encourage you, take a deep breath. Take a breath. Relax. Because the story of Christmas is a story of hope and it's a story of a revolutionary love. There is no story like it in the history of the world. You see, it is God's gift to us and for us. Now, not every gift that you get is like that. But what Jesus did for us was he gave this gift of the possibility of eternal life to us. And because he loves us, he did it for us. It is the hope that the gospel brings. And we want to celebrate Christmas every year. And I was thinking about this. And sometimes in my sermon prep, I'll have a phrase that I think the Lord gives me and I'm thinking about it and I'm working on it. And a lot of times I'll run it by Kim. And uh, I, I had two or three different versions of this little quote that I'm gonna give you, but she liked this one. And to be honest, I like it too. Because I want you to think about this year. When you start to feel stressed out, when you start to feel overwhelmed, when you start to feel lonely, think of this. God wore diapers so that you could wear his righteousness. Now, now let, me, let me say that again, because that, that is a clap-worthy statement, because it is the truth of the gospel. God wore diapers. Remember, Jesus came into this world. He left heaven, and he came into this world as a real human being. He wore diapers. Can you imagine how incredible that is, how humbling it was, how he humbled himself. I mean, the very one that wrote the DNA code, the most complex language they've discovered in the world, in the universe, in history. And he allowed human parents to teach him how to speak. The, the one that created the world, his stepfather, Joseph, was a carpenter. And uh, the one that formed the universe, the one that put the stars into place, the one that was the architect of all of our galaxies and every star in this one and every planet 
and he made sure that the earth was just right, just the right distance from the sun, just the right tilt, just so in every way so that human life could exist. The one that did that allowed an earthly stepfather to teach him how to hold a hammer. Incredible stuff. And understand that God wore diapers so that you could wear his righteousness. And so whenever you get a little discouraged or down, I hope you'll let go of the hype and remember the hope. Because Christmas does give us hope. And uh, we want to focus for the next few weeks on the wonder of Christmas. So today, I'm going to begin. It's not actually the very beginning of the story. It's kind of in the middle and I'm doing it a little bit out of order on purpose. Uh, but today we're going to begin with the story of the wise men. Now, you say, well, what do you mean that wasn't at the beginning of the story? Well, the beginning of the story happened before this. And I know that we see on cartoons and television three wise men. That's not actually what the Bible says. The Bible says they gave three gifts. And a lot of people assume that there were three wise men. But most likely these were... Uh, men from uh, the modern Middle East, Iran, Iraq, in, in that area, they were, uh, they were uh, magi, they were wise men, soothsayers and seers and prophets and so forth. But they became followers of Jesus Christ. And so it was most likely that Jesus was already around two years old when they got there. And so we're going to read the story of how they worshiped him. And so today I want to talk to you about uh, worship like the wise men. How did they worship? We're going to learn from that this morning. Matthew chapter 2, beginning reading in verse number 1. And Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. And about that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. And King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. That's another reason why I think it was probably more than three, because three guys probably wouldn't disturb an entire city. Probably a lot of them. And he called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of the religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people. That was a prophecy about Jesus. And then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. And then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so I can worship him too. How many of you know that the devil will always send somebody or something to get you off your purpose? The devil always does that. He, he was... He, he, the, the, uh, Herod, King Herod was the one that was trying to get these wise men off of their purpose. They had committed to Christ. They were worshiping him. And he was saying, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join you. He wasn't wanting to join them. He wanted to kill Jesus. The devil always tries to send you somebody to get you off course. He always tries to send somebody to mess with your commitment Oh man, do we not live in a time when it's easy to drop our commitment? Do we not? I mean, think of the pandemic. For many Christians, the pandemic became a built-in excuse. I'm not suggesting that there was no legitimacy to quarantining and not being around people. I'm not suggesting that. Please don't hear what I'm not saying, okay? But hear what I am saying. It's really gotten easy. Let, let me speak to those of you that join us online. Our online uh, campus, we call it, is very legitimate. And it is a legitimate way for you to connect with us. And we are continuing to do it. We will do it from now on. We believe in it. It's a very real thing. But I also know, because I've talked to a lot of our members that have told me, and I'm quoting here, oh, I've just gotten kind of lazy and I like watching church in my pajamas. 
well, if, if it's the pajamas that make the difference, then wear your pajamas and come to greet us here uh, as long as they're decent, okay? But here, here's my point, and don't miss this. It's easy. The devil will always send somebody to get you off course. And you know, the purpose of church is not just to worship God. Because I hear people say all the time, I can worship God anywhere, on the beach, in the mountains, in my backyard, in my living room. And that is absolutely true. You can But if you think that's the only purpose of church, then you haven't carefully read the New Testament. One of the most important things about church is the encouragement and the gathering and working with other believers because God has called you to do that. And you can't use your spiritual gift to build the church, to build others, if you're always disconnected. So can I challenge you? If you're one of those that, and I'm not talking about legitimately, we have a lot of people that are watched when they're out of town. We have people that are sick. We have people that can't get here. We actually have people in other states. And we love you. We're so glad that you're a part. But if you've just kind of drifted into laziness, don't be like what Herod was, trying to get these wise men off their purpose. Don't let it happen. Stay the course. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. And it went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. And then they entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. And then they opened their treasure chests And gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Let me just pause here for a second. I'm going to talk about these three things. Let let me just tell you, there's been a lot of bad preaching uh, that kind of misunderstood the point of that. But there are some very important symbols that we need to learn from the type of gifts that these wise men gave to Jesus. And we're going to look at those symbols today. So it said they gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route. For God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Now, if you're one that likes to keep notes, um, you can follow along on our church app. You can follow along on the Bible app. uh, Or you can write this down. But I want to just give you three thoughts from this passage, particularly focusing in on the type or the symbolism, if you will, of the gifts that they gave to Jesus and what that means to us. How can you worship like the wise men? Number one, they worshiped Jesus with their treasure, with their treasure. It said they opened their treasure chests and they gave him gold and frankincense and myrrh. Gold represents your treasure. It always has And it always will. It does represent other things in Scripture in addition to that. But every one of us knows that gold um, as a precious metal represents wealth and riches and things of that nature in our life. So they worship Jesus with their treasure. Now what has to happen for you to give up your gold willingly to Jesus? Well, I believe there are a few things. They worshiped that which was precious to them. They worshiped with that which was precious to them. You cannot truly worship Jesus and hold back what is most precious in your life. I mean, the truth is, um, it's easy to say, I love the Lord. And in our heart, emotionally, we do. But if all you do is have that emotional feeling toward God and toward Jesus... Did you know that you're not actually fulfilling the great commandment? You're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. In Deuteronomy chapter uh, uh, 6 verse 4, um, the great Shema, it, it says that we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, strength, and so forth. Now what does that mean? Well, you love the Lord with your decision-making ability. See, it's one thing to say, boy, I sure do love Jesus. 
there are a lot of people that love Jesus as a concept, but they don't actually love him with their decisions. Your soul is made up of your mind, your body, and your decision-making ability and your emotions. So with your mind, uh, do you just love Jesus with your mind and leave off the other parts? Do you just love Jesus with your emotions and leave off the other parts? You see, a lot of people love Jesus with their emotions because when they hear good Christian music, man, they get stirred up and it's, it's good. Uh, it's important to love Jesus with your emotions. It's important to feel that connection. That's very, very important. But there's more to it than that. You gotta love him with your mind, with your decision-making ability. What decisions do you make? Do you decide every day to serve him? Do you decide every week to make a connection? Do you love him with your decisions? And, and then uh, do, you, do you love him with your body? You say, how do you love him with your body? Well, you show up, that's how. Romans chapter 12, verses one and two, it says that, uh, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. You see, a lot of people say they love the Lord, but they don't show up with their body. It's one thing to love him emotionally. It's one thing to love him from afar. It's one thing to love him with your morality, which that's not really the way that you, you should be moral, don't get me wrong, but that's not the way to please God. Morality comes out of a relationship with God. Right choices come out of a relationship with God, not vice versa. It is when you connect with God through his grace that you're able to make the right choices, not that you please God because you're good, because you can't be good. When we try to please God because we're good, you know what we're like? It would be like if I were to go down to NASA. And I'm not sure even where, I know there's something in Houston, right? Houston, we have a problem, right? Um, I know there's something in Florida, Cape Canaveral. I know there's something up in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, but let's say that I were to go to NASA and uh, I applied to be in charge of the whole shebang of all of the space shuttle and whatever it is that they're doing, exploring space, sending things out into space. Um, and I wanted to be in charge of the whole thing. And they would say, well, Mr. Miller, what are your credentials? What can you give us in your resume? And I proudly pulled out of my pocket a very well-made paper airplane. Now, don't laugh. It's very well made, all right? In fact, I put myself into it. I studied. I worked hard to make that paper plane. Well, they would look at me, and if they didn't call the people to come and, you know, take me away to the nice place, you know, then the, at the very least, they would reject me, and they would mock me, and they would say, how, how silly are you, sir? To think that just because you can make a paper airplane that you can run the space shuttle system. Do you know that's more silly than you and me trying to show God how good we are? I mean, imagine standing before absolute perfection, the personification of holiness. The one that not only has not sinned, but never can sin, never can lie. He's holy, he's righteous, he is good. And I'm standing before him telling him how good I am. Can you imagine how silly that is? Well, the point is this. When we want to worship God, we worship him with our whole soul. Every part of us, our mind, our decisions, our emotions, the body that God has given us. That's how we worship God. They worshiped with what was precious to them. They, the worship changed their attitude about treasure, by the way. Uh, when you begin to worship God, it's gonna change your attitude about the stuff that we cling to so much here on this earth. Not suggesting that you shouldn't work hard, not saying there's anything wrong with having money in the bank, not saying there's anything wrong with driving a new car, or being wealthy, there's certainly nothing wrong about that. But 
the story that Jesus told in the New Testament, it was a parable. It was about a man that was extremely wealthy, and he, he worked hard. He was obviously talented. He was able to save up his money. And he said, you know what? I'm so successful. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger barns. Is there anything wrong with your business growing? No, I hope your business does grow. Is there anything wrong with being so successful financially? Maybe you've got a side hustle. Maybe you've got a job. Maybe you started your own business. Maybe you've saved and you've invested and, and you've had some investments that have paid off. Is there anything wrong with that? Absolutely not. But do you know what Jesus called that man that did that? He didn't say, thou good businessman. He obviously was a good businessman. He didn't say, you smart guy, you, planning for the future, look at you, go. He didn't say that. You know what he said to him? It's kind of shocking. He said, thou fool. Now, why would you call the wealthiest man that you know a fool? Why would you call Elon Musk a fool? Why would you call Bill Gates a fool? Politics aside, the fact is they have been able to be extremely successful. And I doubt when they get on any of these television shows that the host calls them a fool for how they've handled their money. No, they've been very wise with their money and how they made money. But the reason Jesus said to this man that he was a fool was because he left God out of the equation. And if you leave God out of the equation, you are being foolish. Worship will change the use of your treasure. It will change your grip on treasure. And it will obviously change you personally when you begin to worship God and change your attitude about money and things. Now, here's the question. Are you worshiping God with your treasure? Now, an obvious application with that is, are you putting God first in your finances? Are you tithing? Are you being generous? But I want you to think about this. That's not the only thing. Now, here, here's the thing. Sometimes people that have a lot of money, they think just by giving some money that them and God are okay. Oh, me and God are good. I gave some money. And, and that's good. I'm glad you did. Um, but that's not the complete way to worship him. And then there are others that say, you know what? I've, I'm going to volunteer. I'm not going to give money, but I'm going to volunteer and I'm going to get involved. And that's good, but that's not complete worship. And then there are others that say, you know what? I'm so excited about Jesus and the gospel. I'm going to invite lots of friends to come and hear the good news so they can be saved. And that's good. I hope, I hope you do all those things. But that's incomplete worship. You should worship God with your treasure, but also with your time and your talent. And I want you to think about that. It's not enough just to worship God with your treasure or just your time or even just your talent. Those are important. But when you put them together, you're worshiping like the wise men. You see, they worship with that which was precious to them, their treasure. And here's what I know about you, uh, if you're normal, that is, that your treasure, your money, your material things, it's important to you. Now, I realize that some people say, well, that's not as important to me. Well, try doing without it and see how important it is. I hear people say, well, I don't care at all about money. Well, you do like to have a place to lay your head at night, right? I'm assuming you don't want to live on the street. I'm assuming you're not going to sell your house or get out of your apartment and just live in a tent in the park somewhere with no running water. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? That these things are important to us because of what Jesus said, if we seek first the kingdom of God, then all of these other things are going to be added to us and so, um, I know that your time is precious to you. I know that your talent is precious to you. What are you doing 
to worship like the wise men. I'm really proud of our teenagers. Many of them are learning how to worship God fully. And I'm so excited about what's happening in so many of our young people's lives. And and I can't mention all of them. Let me just mention a few of the ones that have been coming to our church and they've been coming to our youth group and how they're stepping up their game. Uh, Janiah, Jalea, and Jewel, three sisters. And we challenge them, not just to come on Wednesday night and participate in the games and the service and all that stuff, but to get involved. And since that time, they have been working in our uh, preschool and children's ministry, giving of their time and their talent to serve God. Kennedy, one of our uh, teenagers, has been working back there as well. And I I could mention lots of others. Tyler uh, serves in our tech team and our uh, our setup team and uh, serves in with the cameras and whatever you call that. I'm struggling here to find the word that uh, I'm looking for, but uh, for the stuff that we film so that people can watch it online. He is involved in that. Hannah's involved in that. Hannah gets involved in the tech and the kids. Jacob serves in tech. Elijah has volunteered to serve in worship, and he was serving on the camera this morning and uh, helping to uh, put our services online. Online, And Enoch that I mentioned earlier, he brought Isaiah Isaiah got saved. Isaiah got baptized today. And you know what I've learned from this? I could go on. But our, our young people are learning how to have a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. They're bringing people wherever they are and bringing them into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. How did the wise men worship? They worship with their treasure, their gold. Here's the second thing. They worship Jesus by faith. You say, where did you get that? Well, frankincense was an ingredient used to make the perfume or the incense for the most holy place. And the most holy place, if you know much about the Old Testament, you know that God told Moses that as the Israelites were wandering, that they were to make a tabernacle. It was not a permanent structure. But it was something that they could set up and tear down. It was very nice, very valuable, uh, but it was also portable. And in that most holy place would be where the presence of God would be. It would be where the Ark of the Covenant would be. And later when the temple was made, it was the same thing. And, And so what frankincense was used for was used in that holy place where God met with his people. Now I want you to get the significance of that. These wise men worshiped Jesus with frankincense. The frankincense represented the place where God said, I will meet you there. They worship God with their presence. The place of atonement represents salvation. And really, I just have couple questions for all of us. Are you worshiping him by meeting him? Are you willing to meet him at church? Are you willing to worship him regularly by reading the Bible and praying? This is important that you meet him there because God said, I want to meet you there. From the very beginning after God created Adam and Eve, you know what he created that garden for? So that he could fellowship with humans. And in the same way, God wants to fellowship with you. Here's the question. Are you meeting him there? Or do you do what most people do? You jar, you're jarred awake by the alarm clock in the morning and you cannot even begin to function until you get at least 1.25 cups of coffee in you. And then maybe you can begin to speak and uh, you get up at the same old time and you go to the same old bathroom, you shave the same old face, you eat the same old breakfast, you drink the same old coffee, you get in the same old car, and you drive the same old way to the same old job, you meet the same old people at the same old job, and you get off at the same old time, you get back in the same old car, and you drive all the way home the same old way, you get home at the same old time, you sit down and eat the same old food, 
You sit down and watch the same old television shows until you fall asleep. You get up then and get in the same old bed. You ask the wife the same old question. And uh, she says the same old answer. And, uh, you know, and then you do it all again the next morning. Some of you just got that. All right, so. But here's the question. Are you meeting him? Oh, I'm not saying are you spending an hour a day reading the Bible. I don't think you have to do that. But you do need to meet God every day. And and there are wonderful ways that you can do that. If you have a phone, you can download the Bible app and you can, if you don't even have time to read it, you can put it on in your car and let it be read out loud to you while you're going to work and pray while you're going to work. You can meet God is my point. And he wants to meet you. He met with Adam and Eve in the garden, and when they sinned, it separated them from God. And in the end, if you read the book of Revelation, you know that God is going to create a beautiful garden city in the end where we can worship God for all of eternity. God says, I want to meet you there. Are you meeting God? Are you worshiping Him through fellowship? Then here's the last thing that the wise men did. They, they worship God with their treasure. They worship God with their faith. That's what frankincense represents. And then they worship God with their service. Myrrh was an anointing, was used as an anointing oil. They made an anointing oil out of it to anoint people for service. And they would combine it with olive oil And uh, in the Old Testament days, uh, any priest that was going to be anointed or set apart for special ministry, they would use myrrh. Now, why would someone give myrrh to Jesus? Well, I believe it's obvious that they're showing that they're giving their service to him. Serving is an offering to God that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And when I serve him, it's like the wise men were giving him that myrrh. They were giving him their ability. They were giving him their talent. They were giving him their time. They were giving him their priority. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 11. I want to read this to you from the message paraphrase, and I love this. And this might help us to grasp what God has done for us and what he expects from us. Listen to what it says. God's various gifts are handed out everywhere. In other words, everybody gets one, at least one. You might have many. But they all originate in God's spirit. So all of your talent, and he's talking about spiritual gifts here, but also talent, I believe. So everything, your ability, your ability to just sing, to lead, to teach, to create, to cook, to be hospitable and host. Uh, to serve. It doesn't matter what it is. All of that comes from God and originates in his spirit. God's various ministries are carried out everywhere, but they all originate in God's spirit. So in other words, he's saying, God gave you something and he expects you to use it for him. He expects you. You say, well, and, and here's the thing. I think a lot of times the church does a poor job in letting people have on-ramps because Let's be honest. Most people think, well, if I'm going to serve God, I've got to do one of just about three or four things. Got to be able to sing or play an instrument. Got to be technically a wizard so I can help with that. Or I can, you know, teach in some way, serving the kids or whatever. And uh, maybe I can do something else. But outside of that, they don't think that they really have anything to offer. But don't you listen to what the Bible says. God's various expressions of power are in action everywhere. God wants to use an expression of his power through you. Isn't that exciting? The fact is God wants to use you. Maybe when you were growing up, you didn't get chosen first. Maybe you got chosen last, and that hurt your feelings. I I played, most of you know, if you've been here long, you know that I played basketball in high school, started in high school and, and played in college. And then after college, I played for a long time in, a, um, in leagues and so forth. 
And in my mind, the older I get, the better I was. All right, so, um, but that's the way it is with men, ladies. Just put up with their nonsense when they're bragging about how good they used to be. Um, but I, I remember one time, I was, I'd played up till I was around 40. And I remember that I'd stopped playing because I thought, nah, I can't keep on doing this. I'm no good anymore. And I didn't play, but I didn't even pick up a basketball for probably eight years. And I was probably like 48, 49 years old. And uh, I joined a gym that had basketball and they had, it wasn't really a league, but it was like, you know, a loose kind of league. There were some really good players that came in and they play pickup games and everything. But I hadn't even played pickup games in a long, long time. And I'll never forget the first day that I went out there, um, I was chosen last. And there were, I don't know, 25 guys out there or whatever, and you got to play, and whoever won stayed up. They kept playing, and, you know, you'd have necks, and you'd choose. And so I was the very last person, because these were like, you know, 18 to 25-year-olds. And they were all young and full of vim and vinegar, you know, and they were just like full of themselves. And this old man, there's no way he could play basketball. So I got chosen last. And I decided that I was going to start practicing like I did when I was in college. And I started practicing every day. I was doing drills. I was doing shooting drills and ball handling drills and all kinds of drills. And I started getting better. I started getting my mojo back. I started getting more at least mildly coordinated enough to play in a pickup league. And I kept getting chosen higher and higher. And I I remember the day, and this was months down the road, the day that there were like 30 guys out there and I got chosen first. First. Bunch of 20-something-year-olds, okay? Now... In my mind, I said to myself, self, this is as good as it gets. You're never going to get any higher because they said, better guard the old man because he can shoot. Okay? And on that day, I retired on the top, all right, because I was chosen first. And I'll never forget how that made me feel as an old man that could shoot, right, as they said. But maybe you felt left out. Maybe you were never chosen first. But you know what God's saying about you? And I want you to get this. He chooses you first. You're his first choice. You're on the first team. Everybody gets to make a difference. Everybody gets chosen. Everybody gets to play in the game. And that's what God says about you. He said, each person is given something to do that shows who God is. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit and to all kinds of people. The variety is wonderful. What is, what is the Lord saying here? He's just saying you matter. He's just saying that give him the myrrh. Give him the service. You know why? He's anointed you. Now, you may not feel like you have a lot to offer, but did you know that Jesus said that if you even give so much as a cup of cold water in his name, that you'll receive a reward for it? The idea here is this. God's not going to hold you accountable for singing if you can't sing. In fact, we all would appreciate it if you don't sing on stage if you can't sing. All right? We would greatly appreciate it. God's not going to hold you accountable for something that you can't do, but he's given you something. Maybe even something that you think is so insignificant as being a host. There are some of you that love hosting. You love it when you're able to make stuff for people, invite people over to your house. Did you know that maybe what you've got is that spirit of hospitality? And did you know how important that is, particularly in small groups, did you know that when you're able to do something like, in, like that in small groups, you are making a huge impact on the lives of people? I know, because we have people in our small group, and their life has been radically changed by that fellowship and the spiritual growth, not just coming on Sunday morning. You've got something. Use it for the Lord. 1 Peter 4.10, each one as a good manager of God's different gifts must use for the good of others the special gift 
he has received from God. You know what the key is? That you use it for others. Not just yourself. For others. And God wants you to make an impact. Worship like the wise men. What did they do? They gave him their treasure. They said, God, here it is. Take first place. It, God changed their life. He changed their grip on treasure. And then they worshiped him with their, their faith. That frankincense. God says, I'm going to meet you there. And, and, and you and I need to meet God and be faithful to do it. And then uh, they worshiped him with myrrh. That is their service. Use what God has put in your hand. Because the greatest ability is not the ability to sing or the ability to preach or the ability to be convincing or to be a technical wizard. The greatest ability is availability. The greatest, avail- uh, the, uh, the greatest ability that you can give to God is your availability to serve him. And that is my prayer that all of us will worship like the wise men. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, help us to worship you like the wise men did. And Lord, we pray now that today, as we give of ourselves to you, that uh, you, would, you would just bless what we're about to do, how we're about to offer to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.